Um, hello, my name is Kate Goodwin. I'm a Professor of Practice in the School of Architecture. On behalf of Robin Dowling, um, the Dean of the School of Architecture, Design and Planning at the University of Sydney, I'd like to welcome you to this launch of the 2022 program at the Penelope Visiting Professorship in Architectural History. And I'd also like to thank um, the Chow Chuck Wing Museum for hosting this event, this event tonight. It's lovely to be in this beautiful building. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we come together this evening and also conduct all of our in-person teaching and research at the University of Sydney upon the unceded land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who for thousands of generations have exchanged knowledge for the benefit of all. I always find when I stand here at Chow Chuck um, and look out over that, that beautiful scene there at what is now known as Victoria Park, it's extraordinary to think that it was once the dense, dense with temperate rainforest vegetation and creeks connected to Blackwater Bay. One can imagine and sense why it was such a special place for the Gadigal people. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. This event has been long anticipated. First planned for June last year, just as Delta outbreak took hold, then again at the start of this month. But caution in the face of widespread flooding saw it deferred to this evening. So, third time lucky, it's fantastic to be going ahead. And I'd like to thank you all for persevering with us um, as we begin a discussion that will span the next few months. And more on this shortly from Andrew Leach. The Penelope Visiting Professorship in Architectural History, which this um, event inaugurates, is possible only through the generosity of our guest of honor, Penelope Seidler AO. As alumna and honorary doctor of architecture at this university, she is a patron and passionate advocate for architecture and the arts, who has done an extraordinary amount for culture in this country. Her gift will enable us um, from this moment on to regularly welcome some of the world's um, most authoritative scholars in the field of architectural history, to undertake work within school alongside the research of our academics, advancing the knowledge of Australia's complex architectural history and locating that work in its global currents. Most importantly, it shares that knowledge with a broad public audience, cultivating an informed interest in architectural history and debate on Australian architecture more generally. On behalf of the university, school, and all of us, the staff, the students, and the public who will benefit from this gift, I'd like to sincerely thank you. And it's also a special honor for me to open this. Um, it's a sort of different worlds connecting. Relatively soon into my own association with the school, I was asked to support the nomination for Jean-Louis. Unbeknownst to those who'd asked me to do so, working here, I'd been working on a major exhibition with him in London at the Royal Academy of Arts that we were regrettably unable to move forward with at the time. So it was one ending and another beginning. I'm going to hand over now to Andrew Leach, Professor of Architecture, who will introduce our inaugural prof Penelope Professor, give us details of tonight's proceedings and the future plans. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we've had to develop something of a taste for contingency in planning for this evening, uh, not least since it was our determination from the outset to meet uh, mostly in person to celebrate the appointment of Jean-Louis Cohen as the inaugural Penelope Visiting Professor in Architectural History. Here at the University of Sydney, uh, we've been trading in architectural history uh, for some time. We've taught courses in the subject since 1884, when Cyril Blackett and then John Sulman uh, took on the task of conveying the canon of great works with the help of James Ferguson and his mighty term on the subject. Uh, this along with a set of examination questions that seemed not to change at all from year to year for quite a long time. I guess those students did pretty well. Over time, the personnel have changed. Um, uh, Sulman taught his course for 25 years, 25 years, others for less time, but leaving their own imprints on our students. David Saunders and Jennifer Taylor come to mind, as does Trevor Howells, and uh, Lee Stickles and Michael Tower sitting at the back, who even now shape what our incoming students think of their field. Close to, uh, over, uh, close to 140 years then, uh, history's place in architectural education at Sydney and in architectural culture in Sydney uh, has, uh, has changed alongside these people. For architecture in particular, history is a kind of material. Uh, I can adapt some words of uh, the German thinker Georg Simmel uh, to this point. 
uh, knowing history is like conceiving of it. The program that we're here to inaugurate this evening is concerned with just this idea. Architecture's capacity to draw history into acts of invention, uh, including acts of criticism, uh, and the questions this procedure raises for us as architects and historians of architecture, students and teachers of architectural design and architectural history. What are the stakes of uh, this use of history and the movement of ideas, models, fragments, and hints for the study and scholarship of this field? I'm pleased to say, very pleased to say, uh, that Professor Cohen Jean-Louis has welcomed the opportunity to direct his encyclopedic knowledge of architecture's history, and particularly that of the long 20th century, to this question. As he will himself explain shortly in a pre-recorded note of welcome, this problem has for him something of an origin in a visit to Australia, not that long ago, where some of those gathered may have heard him speak at Tusculum. That he's bringing this investigation back to Sydney after exploring it in his lectures at the Collège de France, the Berlager Institute, and his home institution at New York University is most welcome. And we look forward to seeing how these ideas can be explored and have been developed uh, through discussion here at this university and in this city. Before I hand over in a, in a fashion to uh, Professor Cohen, I want to say a couple of things by way of introduction. Uh, introduction to him. He's an authority, an authority in the history of architecture of the 20th century, and somebody who pushes always at the lacunae and edges of that history. His exhibition and book, Architecture in Uniform, cannily undermines the divisions we've made out of habit between the interwar and post-war worlds. His exhibition and book on Soviet Americanism uh, restates the paths of cultural transfer between these two world powers, once more, in a sense, in tension. His book on Casablanca with Monica Lebb is at the forefront of the post-colonial reappraisal of French modernism. I'm not going to list his achievements in a way that makes any further introduction of him redundant. I'm going to wait until he's here to do the full thing. Uh, let it be enough this evening, though, to welcome Professor Cohen to the university uh, as this group gathered here as a visiting professor, anticipating his physical visit uh, later this year. And to add my own thanks to Penelope, Penelope Seidler, for her generosity, enabling us to tempt Jean-Louis back to Sydney and to draw in those who will follow in his footsteps. But also for her generosity towards that work and those efforts that attend to architecture as a dimension of our cultural life. Um, I've heard her say rather recently, um, history's where it's at. And, uh, um, which, no, I, I said, I'm, I'm stealing that. I'm taking it, off, so I'm crediting my sources, which is also good historical practice. <laughs> To ask questions of this past, um, of the past, to ask any questions of the past is to look at ourselves, whoever we might be. Um, and we can only better ask those questions, I think, alongside those who will join us as uh, the Penelope professors. I have no doubt that they will collectively be at the heart, prove to be at the heart of our work in this field of architectural history from this point on. And so I'm really excited to be uh, here to uh, introduce this program of work, to anticipate the visit of Jean-Louis Cohen, but also to anticipate years, years of uh, opportunities that we will have to bring people in and talk with them and develop our own thinking and theirs uh, all together. So with all of that said, I'd like now to pass your attention over to the first of our Penelope professors, professors uh, Professor Jean-Louis Cohen. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, talking to you from Paris, where it's the evening of Tuesday, and very glad to have this first uh, contact, even if it's a virtual one with you, uh, introducing the Penelope professorship, which I will uh, uh, have, which I will uh, assume in uh, the early fall of this year. Uh, I'm extremely flattered and happy and moved to be the first one to inaugurate this uh, exceptional initiative. And uh, I wanted to say a few words today about uh, what I'm expecting from it and what I will be 
uh, what I will be doing within the framework of this professorship, which entails essentially uh, a major lecture uh, uh, planned today for October 7, if I've, I'm not mistaken. So a significant lecture plus uh, um, uh, an interaction with uh, colleagues, faculty, students, uh, architects in, in Sydney and beyond in Australia. So it's a commitment which has a sort of a high point and a, a sort of uh, acme, but also uh, other, other components. Uh, I uh, am interested in this opportunity uh, to discuss a series of ideas, an opportunity which has been delayed, uh, as you know very well, because of COVID, because of uh, the other uh, uh, situations which have uh, taken place in Australia, extreme heat, uh, extreme heat waves, fires, uh, floodings, uh, the seven plagues of Australia. I guess you must be awaiting, waiting now for a, a rain of, uh, of crickets as it as in the Bible, uh, so hopefully by September uh, or October, this series of catastrophes will be over and uh, this lecture will be able to take place uh, in person. So what I'm uh, proposing to do in this, in this lecture is uh, expanding and developing a line of thinking which I have developed over the past years. Uh, uh, I won't introduce myself, myself in a lengthy way, but uh, my background is a background in architecture, to some extent in, in design at a certain point in my life, a background in architecture and in history, uh, and in a way a practice of history which is informed by my uh, initial training as an architect, which takes me to the, uh, to the writing and the production of books, which takes me also to uh, curating exhibitions. And uh, if this term was uh, everyone today pretends to be a curator, I'm never adding this line to my CV, but it is also true that since the mid uh, 1980s, I have created a wide range of exhibitions in major institutions. Why? And I'm just saying a, a little uh, uh, something very briefly about exhibitions, but because exhibitions are uh, a sort of ideal way to reconcile the split aspects of my personality and my experience. Exhibitions are about putting knowledge into space, into a more complex space than the space of, uh, that the bidimensional space of a book or the uh, uh, arborescent space of a website. So exhibitions for me are important and many of the books I have made, some probably of the best, uh, of the book in which the best combination of uh, visual material and text is achieved were, uh, were made on the occasion of exhibitions. This is true, for instance, of the last one, one of the last ones uh, produced for the uh, Canadian Center uh, for architecture's uh, show, uh, building a new, new world, Americanism in Russian architecture, which took place uh, now two years ago, uh, more than two years ago. So uh, I'm interested in, in producing beyond historical research in archives, interviews, uh, field work, uh, as I'm still convinced that the buildings are important materials in the history of architecture and not a, a sort of embarrassing embarrassing object which has to be disposed with very quickly as some of my colleagues uh, tend to think. Um, I, uh, I am trying to weave this practice of uh, uh, curating exhibitions, producing book with, with teaching in a sort of triangular system. So the, the theme I will uh, uh, discuss in my in my lecture and perhaps in uh, other uh, peripheral um, peripheral events is uh, in a way an extension of uh, um, uh, reflections and research I've done in the past forty years. I've always been uh, pro interested in what goes beyond the national borders in architecture. Maybe a sort of metaphor of my origin as a Paris-based wandering 
wandering Jew uh, for whom borders are uh, permeable, but also are a challenge. So I've been interested over the years in the relationship between France and Italy, between France and uh, uh, I'm publishing now an essay in a, in a, uh, in an edited volume, which is produced by uh, Andrew Leach, whom I uh, thank very cordially for his uh, uh, organizational uh, work in setting up his professorship. So I've worked on France and Italy, I've worked on France and Germany, on uh, the relationship between uh, Morocco and France in within the French colonial empire. I've been interested also in all sorts of uh, different types of uh, different system of relationships, including, of course, the one which has inspired this uh, latest book between Russia and the US, which is a paradoxical one, when one sees the efforts of Russians to define themselves as a sort of autonomous uh, culture and power, but it's always uh, within the mirror of America. So working on all these bilateral issues, I came to be interested in what I call the trans, a transnational history of architecture in the cities. Just one small uh, note about this, architecture in the cities, I have been always interested in the uh, continuity uh, between buildings and cities or parts of cities. I'm not considering myself as someone who is obsessively focused either on buildings or on cities. There are specialized colleagues. It's not my attitude. I think that cities are made of buildings. Buildings are shaped uh, by cities as much as they shape them. And in my research, I've been always bridging all these uh, scales. So uh, a few years ago, I started trying to understand how uh, cities contaminate and, and buildings contaminated themselves beyond beyond the phenomenon, the all too well known phenomenon of, uh, of influence. And uh, what came to my mind were a series of methods which are used in fields uh, other than architecture, but which have a really real significance in architecture. And uh, now that's how I've started developing uh, a reflection on transurbanity, which is a broad phenomenon, which includes, uh, for instance, a more localized phenomenon uh, such as quotation. So I started one, an important stage in shaping my, my reflection was the um, uh, the conference of Sahans, which was held in Canberra in 2017, if I remember well, uh, where thanks to Gevor Artunian, I was able to give a lecture, which then triggered a, a seminar uh, in, uh, in New York, another seminar at the Belache Institute in, Rutter, in Delft now, at the TU Delft, and a course at the Collège de France last spring. Uh, in the meantime, a little publication came about this issue of transurbanity. So it, this problem will be in the center of what I will discuss in my lecture uh, on, the on the basis of a, a, a very clear and probably uh, exceedingly simplistic uh, idea, which is that no city is, uh, is autonomous and is uh, immune of the... Uh, uh, matrix of other cities, that cities like texts in literature, like uh, works of art, uh, are made of fragments, are made of echoes, are made of uh, transformations of uh, other cities, and sometimes of themselves, of their cannibalizing their own past, as in the case of a city like Rome, uh, among others. Or so uh, this reflection, which will be in the center of my lecture, is informed, as I said, by architecture and other disciplines, by literary theory, the theory of text, and the relationship uh, relationships created between uh, different texts, uh, uh, which are uh, which cover a wide range of figures from quotation to paraphrase to uh, to plagiarism to uh, condensation, etc. Uh, I will also, uh, I will also uh, introduce notions uh, coming from the field of, uh, 
of the mathematics for correspondences and the transformation of uh, geometric figures and also notions that come uh, that come from the field of art because as uh, many uh, among you might know uh, the uh, reflection on on urban plans has been uh, uh, shaped in the past decades by a series of fundamental texts i'm thinking of aldo rossi's architecture of a city or of colin rowe and fred cutter's collage city so the point i have developed recently was a sort of friendly uh, critique of collage city uh, explaining that maybe the the artistic practice of frottage which was invented by max ernst in the mid 1920s uh, would be more productive than the one of collage in explaining how cities are made of fragments which are combined and 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 which sometimes overlap and 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 are in in conflictual relationship between themselves so in substance uh, the uh, the lecture uh, I will uh, hold in October will be a major stage in a reflection which has already a certain uh, history, a certain um, a certain shape, and which is going where to perhaps a new history of urban design in the modern times, perhaps to a series of essays, uh, perhaps an exhibition. Things are not uh, yet very clear in my mind, but at least. Uh, this very uh, significant uh, opportunity to encounter the uh, the audience in Sydney and, and beyond will be a, a great stimulus uh, for me, and I hope it will be a, a great enjoyment for the auditors. Thank you very much for your attention and meet with you very soon. So there's a lot to look forward to. In order to take up Jean-Louis' invitation to, uh, to begin thinking these questions through, I've invited three colleagues here at the University of Sydney. The, the, those of you who have been following, uh, following the progress of this event across the years uh, will have seen the, the uh, personnel change over time, but uh, we have three colleagues here at the University of Sydney who have all undertaken to, offering, um, to offer short interventions to play with this uh, theme of Jean-Louis of Frottage City, the mobility uh, and manifestation of architecture as taken up by architects, um, the, uh, the operationalization of history in the processes of architectural design. Equipped with an essay of Jean-Louis published in the uh, Liber Amicorum of, uh, dedicated to Benedetto Gravanuolo, each has thought through something that they have understood on other terms, uh, exploring the mechanisms of interurbanity, as he puts it, in their respective cases. Uh, so it, uh, I will introduce each briefly in turn and then invite them uh, to speak um, in the order that you see here. Uh, and then we'll have some discussion both amongst ourselves and, uh, and broadly uh, taking in your views from the floor. So it's my pleasure to introduce first um, Michael Mossman, an architect and a doctor of this university and associate dean for indigenous support and strategy in the School of uh, Architecture, Design and Urbanism here at the University of Sydney. Um, many of you will have seen his Wananga Lee Aboriginal uh, Child and Family Care, uh, sorry, Family Centre in uh, Canada in documentation of the most recent um, Venice Architecture Biennale. He uh, joined us from the Government Architect's Office in 2016. He'll be followed by Pevan Peruzzi, um, an architect and lecturer in Islamic art in the Department of Art History here at the university. She specializes in medieval and early modern art and material culture from the Islamic world. The first book is on its way and is tentatively entitled The Poetics and Politics of Shrine Networks. Uh, before joining the university in 2019, Pevan held positions at the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence, uh, the Museum for Islamische Kunst in Berlin, and the, and the British Museum uh, in London. Uh, so we're really excited to have her here. Finally, we'll meet uh, Guillermo Fernandez Abascal, who recently took up an appointment as an academic fellow in architecture within the school here, uh, having most recently worked at the University of Technology, uh, Sydney. An architect and director of the practice uh, GFR2 and alumnus of uh, FOR, uh, he has produced books on the architectural rivalry of Sydney and Melbourne, 
on the production of contemporary architecture and on the work of the Government Architect's Office beyond Sydney, uh, the newly published regional bureaucracy, which I highly recommend to you. Um, each will show their stake in their own way uh, on these themes, and so I'll immediately hand it over to Michael to take it up from here. Thanks, Michael. Hey, everyone. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that I attended the Charles Perkins oration in the Great Hall, um, just over there. And this was in 2016. And it was at this talk that I uh, listened to the introductory speech by the then Deputy Vice Chancellor, Indigenous Strategies and Services, um, Shane Houston. And there was a thing that really um, caught my attention. And he said this quote, he said, it's an important thing we do to acknowledge country and traditional owners. And it's important to see in everything around us that part that reflects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and our culture in this 62,000 years that we've been on this land. This marble floor was quarried uh, from Gandangara country to the southwest of Sydney. The sandstone walls were quarried from Wongal and Gadigal country down near Piemont. And those magnificent timber beams were up there, were taken from Bunjalung country on the north coast of New South Wales. So we're never too far from the memory and life of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples wherever we are, end quote. So I took notice of these words at the time and um, because I was sort of situating the most colonial of places here on this uni um, and situating it through country. So situating it culturally. And he was situating it architecturally. Its materiality was being connected through time and space to practices before contact to the present. Now, so at the time I was about to um, commence my studies uh, for a PhD and with the thesis and I submitted it um, at the end of 2020. And little did I know that those words that I heard in that, in that oration that formed the basis of the last chapter of the thesis. And when Andrew asked me to present something tonight, um, he was like, oh yeah, because he, he read it. And he was like, oh yeah, you should um, talk about that, um, that chapter. So here I am having a yarn with you and, um, you know, carrying out this business. So my doctorate, which was titled um, Third Space Architecture and Indigeneity, it was awarded in April. Um, I'm going to be graduating uh, next month. Um, and that's like the first Indigenous you know, gradu PhD graduate in architecture um, in Australia. And um, so they asked me to join these conversations, you know, about in the architecture school about um, Jean Louis appointment. So I was keen to have a look and, um, at the literature and um, expand my horizons um, to, to, to sort of get a sense of what it was all about. So the, the, the quotation that um, featured in the, the quotation, right, it's um, a, a feature of the Frotage City paper and uh, there's some wonderful moments that resonate with me um, that relate, particularly relating to that paper that I'd like to um, give you as my take on this quotation and how they relate to that chapter of my thesis and more importantly, the thinking um, that's resulted from that exercise. So the first one um, thing that sort of popped out for me when reading that, that paper, he was referring to ben, uh, Benjamin who said quotations in my work are like wayside robbers um, who um, lead out armed and leap out armed and relieve the idle stroller of his conviction. Now, you know, I'm in this, I'm working in this space and sort of doing business in this space um, with this, with a distinct cultural background um, and lens and it's, 
that's something that I'm always looking through that's continually shifting and evolving. And more specifically, it's a lens that's framed by, largely framed by First Nations ways of being, knowing, and doing. And, you know, particularly how it's relating to country. So I'm Kuku Yelenji, um, which is rainforest country um, north of Cairns. Gimoi Yudinji is the traditional name of Cairns, um, which is where I grew up. And I'm now on the land of the Gadigal. So for me, and you know, many First Nations people that I know, and especially in architecture, you know, architecture is always built on country. And this sort of leads me to the, the following proposition that all architecture on this continent is a quotation. And you know, looking through the paper some more and Jean-Noy reflects on Dan Amin, who reflects on Michelet as an author, who, um, as an author, quote, who, no matter where he's quoted, um, makes the reader forget the book in which the quote appears. So that seemed really pretty interesting to me. And I sort of, you know, for the purposes of this presentation tonight, it's like, well, to me, the book, you know, the book is this country. Like the quotation is the decree of Terra Nullius. It's the line in the sand, you know, that Philip drew on the hub beach when interacting with, with locals and expecting an agreement to this new concept of what land tenure meant, which was essentially, which was stealing territory. And, you know, it's like this crested location for the Great Hall that's over there, um, here on kangaroo ground, this place. It's the disconnection and interruption of cultural practices. We've talked about that today, right? Um, it's a, it's, it results in the stealing of territory, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the stealing of children, of ways of life, destruction of landscapes. So this country and its First Nations cultures has quotations all over it, and yet the quotations are, as mentioned in the Charles Perkins oration intro, you know, they're never too far away from, never too far from the memory and life of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, wherever we are. So, you know, part of the, the, that chapter was looking at the Great Hall, that's Blackett's um, you know, building design. And, um, you know, that's a bit of a quotation itself. Um, it's an intertectonic migration, as the, the term um, you know, refers to in the paper. That's iterative of earlier designs and structures. You know, that's a bit of borrowing and copying or stealing. You know, the Victorian Gothic revival style. Um, you know, from, this is Emmett's new college in London. So that's fairly close. And you know, that sort of comes, goes back to you know, Anglo-Saxon, the Great Hall typology, uh, 500 to 750 AD. So I could see parallels with Jean Noy's case study of um, Le Capuzio's Palace of the Soviets. And it's you know, multifaceted intertectonic migrations over time across continents to arrive at you know, Saruman's St. Louis Gateway in the US. Um, so in my, in my um, thesis chapter, I described an exercise that I carried out. Like, a year and a half after that Houston intro. And it was an exercise that collaborated with high school students um, and the Great Hall and its narratives and its intertectonic migrations. Um, so the task was, you know, is designed and built an ephemeral structure that interrupted the procession. You know, it was a, it was a very, very temporary thing. But as a structure that framed the views with openings to um, the Gandangara marble floor and the Bunjalung timber roof structure you know, and, the, and the Wongal Gadigal sandstone walls. Um, so long story short, it was like the structure, it's round, it's modelled, you know, off 
let's say it's modeled off Buckner's to Fuller's geodesic dome. And you know, I could draw parallels with shelters from my own cookie LNG uh, heritage um, to initiate these sorts of personal intimate um, connections. So the connections of for each of the architectonic qualities, um, you know, I saw that the marble that's used in the whole floor, you know, that the Ganangara people had interacted with across millennia, and it also connected its use for most of the terrace houses that we inhabit and the fireplace hearths, you know, the Sydney region. And the sandstone walls, you know, that weathered over immense amounts of time um, for you know, form shelters for placemaking for local community use. And it's firmly embedded through most public government buildings that give this city its distinct qualities. And connections to place. And the timber of the exposed roof structure, you know, that timber getters milled from Bundjalung country with its significant cultural practices, connected to these important places on that country. We can now see sort of the detriment of what that country is going through now. So the Great Hall's Victorian Gothic style, you know, roof, and it's reaching for the sky, it's more pronounced, you know, than these sort of Anglo-Saxon halls and more akin to the aspirations of you know, Gothic church structures, Romanesque style before that. You know, striving for the sky to reach up to God. So exploring the, the, the Great Hall in this way, you know, I was able to appreciate these First Nations and Western stories to understand, you know, a little bit more of the meaning behind them in the context of the quotation. So importantly for tonight, I counted the notion of my own proposition that I started with at the beginning, you know, whereby these quotations are always, they always contain the narratives of country. Um, its genealogies. It's always part of country. It becomes country, and the stories we make are intricately constructed concepts tied into narratives that reach back to the beginning of time. So it's up to all of us to meaningfully understand this um, and interact with it by building relationships, creating dialogue, transforming ways that we appreciate architecture. So I navigate a third space to speak. So next time you walk into the Great Hall, you know, think about its qualities and narratives and memories on these multiple fronts and all its intertectonic migrations. That way your experience will be richer, you'll connect to country, connect with our colonial histories and give something back of yourself, to give back something of yourself to become part of its storylines as it moves into the future. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm going to play with the following question, that how are buildings coated, translated, or invoked by new work? And I'm going to speak about replications and quotations of the Kaaba in Saudi Arabia, the most significant pilgrimage site for Muslims. And I want to think through um, how its jaw has reverberated in architectural design throughout history. So the image that you see on the screen is a contemporary invocation of the Kaaba by the Saudi Arabian artist Ahmad Matar, who is um, from a series called Magnetism. Um, and in it, he uses this cubicle magnet and uh, metallic filings to create miniature replications of the ritual of um, circumambulation around the Kaaba, playing with the iconic black and white colors dominating the ritual scene uh, with negative and positive space and with light and darkness. Knowledge of this sacred site circulated through textual descriptions and visual representations in book illustrations and pilgrimage certificates throughout centuries. And what you're looking at on the left, you're looking at an actual photo of the pilgrimage 
um, around Kaaba. And on the right, you're looking at a detail from um, a much larger scroll um, that was basically a pilgrimage scroll. And beyond their aesthetic uh, value, these were actual documents that had um, legal value and were acted as proof that someone had actually be um, to the pilgrimage to Mecca. Like many other sacred sites, spatial um, replications of the Kaaba have been common and invoked a range of strategies from um, imitating the form of the Kaaba to more subtle and non-mimetic strategies. This, for instance, is a homemade drive-through substitute of the Kaaba that was made in Maryland in 2020 when the pandemic hit. And Saudi Arabia announced that they were reducing the number of, pilgrim of pilgrims to Mecca from around 2.5 million in a year to 1,000 only. So that was a really big change. And this was one strategy to kind of overcome uh, the problem of not being able to go to Mecca for this community. The example that I want to focus on today takes a different and less formal approach to invoking the Kaaba. And I want you, and I want to talk um, about and walk you through how this is exactly done um, so that we have a sense of the myriad possibilities of citations and quotations in architecture and in the built environment. In this example, the experience of visiting the Kaaba is um, replicated through an interplay of poetry, painting, and architecture. And this case study will take us to the 15th century. So I'm kind of um, new work to me is new work that was created in the 15th century. Um, so it will take us to the, to the 15th century and uh, to the central south plateau of India, um, known as the Dakan, to a tomb that belongs to a Muslim ruler of the Bahmani dynasty outside the town of Bidar in Karnataka, India. So you have a map on the left that shows you the town of Bidar and its location in India. And on the right, you have the exterior view of the tomb. And on the exterior, this square dome chamber is very similar to contemporary um, tombs from the period and from this region. And on the interior, it is heavily painted and inscribed. It's covered in motifs that are shared with the visual language of book paintings and textiles. Uh, so you have these intermedial connections. And it's covered in talismanic devices, mystical poetry, and self-referential religio-political inscriptions. In the epigraphy, the building is characterized not only as the mausoleum of this king, but also as a metaphorical garden and as a mystic's lodge. And a self-referential Arabic inscription declares the building as a Kaaba. Now, analogies between a funerary structure and the Kaaba were a common trope in the Islamic world. Usually, these are interpreted as a rhetorical device. I'm interested in what lies beyond this metaphor and whether we can actually understand it um, uh, beyond its rhetorical function. So I will take a little detour here to show you a couple of examples from contemporary book paintings that demonstrate why we may indeed read the link between this tomb and Mecca as more than a rhetorical device. And in a way, look at paintings and think about how um, architecture was imagined beyond architecture. Representations of the Kaaba are abundant in book illustrations and narrative scenes. And while they don't always precisely imitate the cubicle structure of the Kaaba, they usually maintain enough iconographical connections to um, the actual building for it to be easily recognized. Uh, I'm showing you a very, very common representation of the Kaaba. So you can see that the uh, book artists um, have made the decision to kind of add a dome over the cubicle building, but the overall structure, the black textile that covers, usually covers the building, and the hand gesture of the pilgrim all give us clues that we are looking at the Kaaba. However, 
see how different this painting looks. This illustration comes from an anthology of classical Persian texts. And this is specific illustration, which I'm connecting to the tomb that I showed you before, depicts Alexander the Great as a pilgrim, as a Muslim pilgrim at the Kaaba. And this was a common scene in visual traditions that presented Alexander as an explorer of different religions. In this illustration, instead of showing Alexander outside the cubicle structure of the Kaaba, as was the norm in this period, he's shown paying respect to what looks like an interior space with um, features um, and spatial arrangements and decorative motifs that closely resemble those in the interior of the tomb in India that I showed you. So we have um, chevron pilasters, stylized vases with flowers sprouting out of them, cross-shaped pomets um, that you see all over the building, and um, horizontal almond-shaped cartouches above the entrance of the Kaaba in the painting, as well as the vertical, um, the general overall vertical composition of the five-tiered structure of the Kaaba image, which resembles that of the walls of the interior of the tomb under its zone of transition from a cube to an octagon and then a dome. It is as if the shared visual idioms between the architecture and painting were reshuffled in a slightly different compositions. And my point here is not that the tomb or the painting directly informed one another. Rather, I want to make the point that in the process of replicating the sacred, artists and architects drew upon a variety of shared visual, linguistic, and religious sources that at times challenge straightforward notions of depiction. Now, with these connections in mind, let's go back inside the tomb and have a look at how the quotation of Mecca was enacted. The lower band of inscription that runs around the entire perimeter, uh, which, is, which I've marked for you on the screen, um, contains verses from four poems by a Sufi saint from Iran, who was the spiritual guide of the king in India that, who is buried here in the tomb. Rather than treating the epigraphy as a source of data for the dating function or meaning of the building, what I'm emphasizing here is trying to think through spatial modes of engagement between epigraphy and architecture. So I'm thinking about questions of placement, about physical sequence, and the directionality of inscriptions. So while other inscription bands in this tomb uh, feature poetic excerpts that are like a patchwork put together from different sources, quotations from different uh, texts, the four poems in the inscription band here follow the exact same sequence in the Sufi's book of poetry, which kind of gives us a clue that there was an intention here, an intentional ordering of this space through quotations with a start and an end point. And here, in, with the circle, you see the start and, and the end point of these inscriptions. And this inscription ban is positioned at eye level, which also suggests that the order here could be synchronized with human uh, movement in this space. The starting point of the inscription band could indeed have been the starting point of the circumambulation ritual that is performed to this day around the cenotaph of the king in the middle of the tomb. And this arrangement make that corner that I showed you um, on the eastern side of the building the principal corner of the tomb which is a spatial configuration that resonates with the ritual of uh, circumambulation around the Kaaba. At the Kaaba, on the eastern corner, we have uh, the famous black stone, which you can see in the image on the right, circled. And the black stone is what allows the pilgrims to actually um, kind of um, count each round of circumambulation to reach a total of seven. 
So what is marked in the Kaaba by the black stone is marked by words of poetry in the tomb in India. So-called copies of sacred sites were a common phenomenon in the pre-modern world. The most common perhaps being copies of um, the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Copies did not need to represent the exact appearance of the original, but only contain distinguishing features, for instance, measurements. And one common practice that allowed uh, Muslims to impart sacred qualities upon sites related to the Kaaba was the mixing of Mecca's soil with the building material. So it kind of goes back to Michael's point about materiality. For instance, it was very common um, to make bricks that were, to use bricks that were made from Mecca's earth in, in buildings. These types of material connections, whether based on formal features, measurements, or the building material itself, pass over into a supra-material quality here in the tomb that we are looking at. So the function of these quotations really rest on the words of poetry, their spatial arrangement in the building, but also the ritual activation through the movement of our bodies in this space. And I just want to finish on this note by looking at this map to remember how much of the efficacy of citations and quotation depends on the movement of humans and architectural knowledge and materials with them. Whether we are thinking about bodily movements within the space of a building or in an urban setting or through broader patterns of transregional mobility. Thank you. Hi. Um my talk will be slightly different to my first previous colleagues, but I think it would be an interesting way to wrap up all together. Um, first, uh, my name is Guillermo Fernández Abascal, and I would like to thank um, Andrew Leach for the invitation to be part of the event History for Architecture. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm an architect and a new practice fellow at the University of Sydney, and I have a couple of small architectural practices, GFA2 and GFA. Um, for our generation, the history of and for architecture is incredibly important for our work. We often ask ourselves certain questions. How do we relate to what came before us? What does it influence our work and our, practi our colleagues' practices, or whether it does influence us at all? And how do we study past architecture? Undoubtedly, there has been a renewed interest in history since 2018, since 2008 in, um, among some of my colleagues. As I mapped uh, a few years ago with Alejandro Zarapolo for the Global Architectural Political Compass, where you can see over there on the right side, historicism deserves its own category. In our teaching, we overwhelm our students with the ancestors of their projects. Everything has already been done, as we often repeat, but we still aim for a minimal pro meaningful project which establishes which establish a conversation with history. History is perhaps our favorite constraint, a cultural constraint. Far from a postmodern position that literally evokes historical architectural forms, and far from the work of the previous generations that use history to create a theoretical framework for architecture. History becomes for us a constellation of selected references, collecting from many historical periods and trips, obviously, and geographies, Alejandro de la Sota, Sinkel, Oiza, and De Gao, reveal a very different attitude of inquiry, more directly related to my own interests, my own research, and my own approach, without becoming strictly operational or literal. But of course, not always. Following the simple question of how we study past architecture today, I'm going to briefly talk about our recent book, Regional Bureaucracy, a collaboration with my colleague, uh, Hamis McIntosh. Um, and this that I didn't mention is my first work, the Nairi Foundation uh, behind uh, Oiza's masterpiece, one of our local heroes. In any case, today is about this. This is not the monograph of the Gao. The goal is not to capture the truth, either exhaustively or from a historical perspective. Historians will get quite upset with me. 
nor to make one clear argument about the Gauss production, but rather to present a selection of relevant regional wars that reveal a sense of its good architecture. None of the projects are presented in a comprehensive manner. We have been accused of it several times, as we wanted to leave a space for readers to make their own interpretations and perhaps visit the buildings themselves. In the end, maybe this is a travel book to extract some quotes. Um, but obviously, and I'm gonna read a few of the, of the things here because the, the government architect constantly quote. Uh, they quote between themselves, they quote other people be, due to their travels because architectural um, Australian practices particularly quote more than others, I would argue. Um, I will do a few outrageous claims that then maybe they can be discussed afterwards. Uh, this is the um, David Turner's um, Albury government offices in, from 1966. Um, but um, we will go to the office blocks slightly later. First, uh, we are gonna check a few buildings in Armidale, okay? Um, and here on the left, the Austin College, but some of you could think that we are in Arus or maybe in the north of Europe in any other place. Prior to the design of the student residence at the UNE, government architect Farmer visited the student halls at the University of Aarhus, Denmark. It was the chosen material palette which was really there to across the university that primarily influenced the designs of the residential colleges at the UNE. So in that sense, the dormitories probably are the ones where more direct quotes appear here and there. The Gao chose a subdued palette, white painted, rough textured brickwork, probably the only thing available at that time yeah, around there, copper roofing, timber of the saw, and some glass mosaic decoration for a campus cover in European trees and foliage. And in um, farmer um, reminiscence appear clearly explained some of the trips where they get some of the quotes. Um, the, um, another one of, of, of these ones on the left, the, and another of the, the chairs at the bottom. The student dormitories became the ultimate testing ground for combining beauty and economy. Instead of focusing on the functional aspects, the rooms themselves, the girls shifted their attention to the dining halls, courtyards, staircases, and even furniture. Less regulated areas that allow greater architectural freedom within efficient halls. And again, the, the course they are on the left that maybe you have seen in other, in other buildings, but I will not tell you. It's up to the avid reader to discuss. <laughs> in New England Regional, again, the, the ubiquitous um, white brick painted, and this one is, is, is a doppeldonger, or a, I don't know if doppeldonger is the right word. It's, it has a twin, it has a, queen, a twin in Penrith. Uh, so the same building is designed twice. It's probably more than a quote, it's just a copy, a flagrant copy. Um, there is nothing particularly remarkable in the architecture of this museum, nor in this clone in Penrith. But what interests about this gallery is how it sits within a postmodern debate and the evolution of the Gao itself. Andrew Anderson, together with Turner, was able to strike a delicate balance between adapting to the local context of Armidale and introducing classical compositional logics, including uh, axial symmetries and a, and a distinctive circular segment. The building easily integrates the characteristic elements of the local territories, not to mention again Ted Farmer's ubiquitous white bricks and inclined sentient into the structural organization of the plan. Penelope probably knows this well, she's good friends of Andrew, I believe. <laughs> Um, Cotamundra government offices for me is the predecessor of the Opera House. And yes, in this little town, uh, two hours hour and a half from Sydney, uh, Peter Hall tested some of the details of the Sydney Opera House. And um, I would encourage you to visit uh, some of these, to check some of these copper moldings, some of the palustrate par parapets, and some of the courting wall details. Uh, Murrumbarma High School is another of these uh, twins that has a, an identical twin. Uh, it is worth mentioning that Murrumbara has an identical twin in Kulken, Bilabun High School. But that story of a direct quotation or a copy can wait. And it's obviously related to economy because the schools where is where the copies uh, probably make sense that basically the state tender the same design twice. And back to the offices, no? In 1964, David Turner was appointed to design three regional government office buildings, one each in Albury, Inverell, and Narrabri. Although the plans differ, the details are identical. Thin brass fascias are mounted on a three by two timber buttons fixed to six by two timber studs. 
columns are top and tail with impossibly thin aluminum saddle gaps. Balustrades made from only two pieces of steel support a parallel front channel that flanks its building. As ever, the detailing combines depth construction with elegant simplicity. While these details were all designed at the same desk, they were implemented almost a thousand kilometers apart. This economy of means through duplication facilitated efficiencies in design for the regional bureaucracies across the state. The quotations Michael was pointing, perhaps. A more prolific example of a statewide architectural recycling is hard to find in Australia. And here you can see different plans on the left, exactly the same details in the street buildings separated quite a bit apart. Here, Narrabri, very different building, but the same handrail there on the right, a, a different one different plan, or Inverell, no? where the same happens again. You can see the column there with the thin detail that we were pointing, or the parapet in front of, of the windows. And all of them, not by chance, have a, this generic parapet and gutter detail that is repeated once and again over the, the production of the, of the gout. Um, to, to finish, some, some of the, I'm bringing you some of the images that didn't make it to the book, but maybe really quote more directly uh, some of these, the, 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 the quotes of Arus or, or some of the other campus that farmer of their colleagues uh, visited, because uh, the GAO has a very extensive uh, travel program that allows some of the best uh, architects to travel around to quote Leira, of, co of course. Another no, like, I think we are in Finland. Um, and to finish, or almost to finish, um, I would like to think that that image is not that dissimilar to my first work. Perhaps I was misreading history, as I often do. Um, all these, or all, all of the things that I have shown you today, can be read as a kind of a generational attitude, in which we mix select historical references and our own work to build a framework based on an apparent banality, the celebration of the ordinary, the definition of a specific character with certain ambiguity, of course, the international reduction of the means of construction and the precision of the answer, sometimes via history. Um, by the way, note, I, I would like to finish with a very shortened note. Some of these words are borrowed, quote, misquote, and misread from some of my colleagues who also share a passion for history for architecture. Thank you. Mm. Uh, different, um, uh, I really like the idea of, act, of, of exploring this concept of history for architecture, a term that I myself have borrowed that's been widely borrowed, um, but that entered into uh, our lexicon through the agency of Bruno Zevi in the 1950s and 60s. Um, Historia para Arquitectura, a, a lecture he took to Argentina and uh, which um, became the basis of thinking through the problem of uh, what history is for architecture in particular. Um, something that's distinct from the study of architecture within the confines and rigors of the history of art, something that sits outside but also connects to social history, that connects to history of construction, but is somehow bound up in the thinking and the mentality of, uh, of architecture. So, I'd like to invite you to reflect on this problem of a, or this, this opportunity, this, this, this um, identification of a kind of history that is uh, open to invention, that's open as, as material for invention, uh, something that we can indeed study, that we can appreciate, that we can participate in through experience and all kinds of other registers, um, and that can be activated through these processes of appropriation and reinterpretation and invention and architectural design. Um, how can we come to value history as a material of architecture such that it has its own history that we can read from using all kinds of other tools? And how, how can we make it converse with other ways of seeing the world? Too much? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I want to. Maybe, uh, maybe I can put Guillermo on the spot because he, he starts. He starts. So, like, what, 
what does it mean to be, what does it mean to upset an historian? I guess that's another way of putting the same question. What does it mean to, how can you do history wrong? Were you upset with uh, my building or my book? Too upset. Too upset, not too, not too. Um, I think there is a thin line between being rigorous enough and not being rigorous enough. And I think as a practitioner, sometimes you need to operate on that thin line, and sometimes you can get it wrong, and sometimes you can get it right. Um, I think even Matt that writes also on regional bureaucracy that exists there, sometimes um, he wrote me an email, I remember, that I used the term preservation wrong, uh, because I think in Spain it's used differently. And I think that's what the, I think maybe we, as practitioners, we are not so precise in the use of some things of, and also that we, we like to take that history a bit more open because it's incredibly productive for us. As I mentioned, it's, it's perhaps our favorite constraint, uh, more than sight, more than uh, sun, more than any other thing, I would argue. I don't, but may, I, I was provoking it. Eh? Historians normally don't get too upset with me. <laughs> and Pavel, maybe uh, I can prompt you to talk about these kinds of um, uh, either intentional or acceptable uh, deformations that happen over time as, uh, as a model like the Kaaba becomes taken in and returned to uh, like backwards and forwards across between cultures. I mean, um, it, it's a fascinating kind of topic to think about um, because there, there's always been a tension about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. The image that I showed you with the 2020 drive through pandemic Kaaba, that, that was quite interesting because as, um, I, I can't remember, it was probably a Guardian article, but as it was posted on the internet, it, it kind of created very different responses among people, um, uh, practicing Muslims and um, um, you know other members of the public as to whether this was um, acceptable, legal, legal or not. And I think um, it's a it's a really fascinating question to think about the history of that and and how um, this kind of you know um, taking something and making it your own or taking fragments from really the city, um, the environs of an architecture in order to kind of replicate it and spread it out um, around the globe. It kind of, um, it becomes that interesting story um, and the point that, um, you know, we kind of started with in, in terms of um, there's no city that does not contain quotations within it. So I think it kind of ties in with that in an interesting way. Michael, I think you take that to think, an extreme position. I think maybe like there's more, there's more to the story or it's, you know, history is his story. Like that's a public enemy line, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like, uh, you know, if we start to unravel these invisible spaces that are present, then you know you're going to find out a little bit. You're going to find out a little bit more, and it's going to continually um, become more become more visible. And I think, like the, the you know the the months um, the, the the trading map, it's like so relevant to place here and the different sorts of um, interactions that took place and no doubt there were, you know, um, fragments of culture that were just, you know, that permeated throughout the whole continent and, you know, these intertectonic migrations that, you know, informed place. But it's like place is always relational, as John was saying, like there's always relationships that are um, connecting um, entities to each other, and that then in turn creates these new sorts of, you know, information. We were talking about this a bit earlier today, but I was really struck in thinking about the um, the, the timber elements in the Great Hall are originating from Bundjalung country, part of a great process of deforestation and cedar getting that. Um, that destabilized waterways in areas that now prove to be inundated and striving for security uh, precisely because of decisions that were made um, and that have uh, fed into the architecture of the Great Hall. 
I wonder if I wonder if I can throw things open to the audience. Oh, please. Oh, okay. oh right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a quotation from Rainer Bannum, which brings us really into an issue of the relevance of architectural history in the present day and in um, Bannum wrote, they were for allowing technology to run its course and believed that they understood where it was going even without having to bother to acquaint themselves with it very closely. In the upshot, a historian, presumably somebody like Bannum, must find that they produced a machine age architecture only in the sense that its monuments were built in a machine age and expressed an attitude to machinery in the sense that one might stand on French soil and discuss French politics and still be speaking English. This was written 66 years ago and Bannum's uh, recommendation was that the architect was always trailing behind technology, that technology was outpacing and running ahead of the architect. So his solution was, and his recommendation about why modern architecture failed to speak French when they were talking about French politics was to follow Buckminster Fuller. And that is, he regarded culture as luggage that we carry on our back. And the only way we can keep up with fast moving technology, and as a, an older person, I'm struggling more and more to keep up with the pace of technology the only solution is to jettison, to simply drop our backpack and unload ourselves and lighten ourselves so we can run faster with technology. And as you were saying, where does the historian fit in? What, what is his situation in a society where I think most of us are struggling and challenged by the rapidity and the, s the increasing pace of cycles of technological change. How should the historian, is it a case of following Bannon and we get rid of culture? We get rid of history? The arts are irrelevant? The CP Snow Division that the arts and science have failed to communicate between one another? Do we try to maintain a connection between art, society, the humanities, technology, and, and whatever? So that's the question I'm posing. That's a tough, that's a tough question. Well, I face it every day when I sit down in front of my computer and I can't work out how to do things. I, I, I have an answer, but I want to give everyone else a chance to jump in first if you have, a, if you have something lined up. I mean, um, as someone who has traveled around a lot with no, no, no. luggage, <laughs> Usually I think about that sweet moment that you actually unpack your luggage and put things in order. And I think I would like to think of the work of an architect, at least part of the work of an architect, to, in unpacking that luggage and arranging things um, that, you know, could be culture, could be material, could be the environment in, in ways that are meaningful. I think that's all I have to say. I think that if we slow you down, we're doing our job properly. I, I think that if we slow you down, we're doing our job properly. If, well, if the job of, if the, if the, sorry? Is that uh, if, if history 
if an encounter with history, an encounter with culture, has the effect of making you think more carefully about where you are, who you are, what you're doing, then I think that it's working well. I describe history within an architecture school as being the kind of con con conscience and perpetuity that just is in the air of the architecture student who, you know, is prepared to, like, that stops the student from taking decisions that are slightly too easy. It makes them think twice about the work that they're doing. And I think, um, I think the examples that Michael has shared with us about seeing something familiar and about which we all can say something because we've spent time in the Great Hall and we've, we know our way around, but to see something in the round, a little more in the round, just by being alert to other questions that are documented and available through both uh, traditional knowledge and documentary knowledge, then I think that that too makes our experience richer. So in this, I guess I'm against, I stand against Madam. Um, uh, and uh, in that, um, I think the job isn't to move faster and faster and to shed more and more, but to slow down and take on more and more. We have no control over the pace. Well, we can help with that. It's, I, I think everyone is struggling mm. with technology, outpacing their ability to adjust and assimilate and do what you're talking about, of thinking through, you know, the internet and what it's doing, some of the negative consequences, because we haven't thought through what can go wrong, we're so enamored with the next step. Another question at the back, Bobby. Oh. By the microphone. Oh. I'm keeping this in circulation. Just a very brief comment about that. I, it just resonates with things that I've been reading lately, and I have tremendous respect for Bannum, obviously. Um, but I think those words are written in a time when we would believe that technological development, like the logic of capitalism, democracy, these kinds of things somehow converged. Whereas I think in the present moment, it's so easy to imagine how this kind of pacing leads us directly to fascism or whatever else. And so, I mean, if we don't at least try to make an effort to slow down and take control of it, um, I mean, there's no... Uh, mine is more of a comment, I guess, uh, uh, I'm just going to step out, out of the domain of architecture for a while and think about the importance, importance of history in general, I think. And I don't quite get the argument against it because history is quite inclusive. History is not trying to deny present or disregard the future. But um, so it's a question of, I guess, origins or genesis of things, or roots in philosophical terms without even talking about architectural history per se. Um, and secondly, and strangely enough, I think technology is actually posing a risk, posing a threat to um, architecture as a discipline and what is architecture is about. Um, and it, it has been actually quite detrimental and particularly, I mean, there is no scope for it to discuss these things perhaps in this forum. But, um, you know, this fascination with parametric design, for example, um, certain schools of architecture n kind of excluding architectural history and theory from their curriculum altogether. I don't know what's the basis for them. I mean, architectural history, particularly um, getting a little bit of a flashback towards uh, Bruno Zevi's account to look at theory as the body which operates within history as a material around it and the operation. And I'm referring to the body metaphorically as the discipline, the body of architecture operating within that material. Um, if you are not engaging with um, history, what is it that we're engaging with? Like, I mean, um, I, I wasn't quite sure about that counter argument uh, posed and uh, kind of the criticism of history. Where does that come from and what is the alternative to it? You can take mine as a question. Um, and it's directed specifically to Michael and the encounter with uh, you know uh, I sort of struggle with architecture per se in terms of it's something that's you know it's about creating place so the place is not just confined to that plot of land or 
you know, that built form. It's like the, 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 the entire context of that, you know, that, that in a specific area relates to. So it's like trying to zoom out um, and, you know, get this more deeper understanding of what it is about the greater, you know, context of place rather than just the, you know, the nuts and bolts of that actual piece of architecture. So, uh, you know, that, that example, it's like you're zooming right out and you're trying to bring in all these other, you're bringing in these other narratives of, you know, these far away places that can be, you know, you can look right into it and find it's, you know, when you're trying to find the uh, etymology of, in language, you know, you, you start to search back and find all these different sort of interwoven, you know, pieces of information that all seem to come together into this one spot. But it's vast, you know, that network is really just, you know, it's hard to fathom. So, you know, it's how we can appreciate the, you know, a more in-depth understanding of this place. So it's not like, you know, we're sort of floating on the surface at the moment, passing through, you know. So I, that's what I try to impart for, for, for my students. Thanks, Kevin. We had, we had one question just behind you there. Kevin, there we go. Yes, sir. Please. Um, there's been some... No. <laughs> the words culture and baggage are going through my mind at the moment. And when we talk about architectural history, it's easy to forget that the baggage that we're all carrying is partly to do with the people who taught us and the leaders or the peers of our professional life. Um, in my case, there was a visit to Sydney in 1954, which Penelope will remember. Gropius came to Sydney. Most people in this room would have a clue that that happened. He was the first of the greats of the moderns, and I think possibly the only to come to Sydney. A historical event. But more to my, the point I'm trying to make is that the cultural baggage we carry is to do with our teachers. And during the 70s in Australia, there were 14 or 15 chairs of architecture, urban design and planning, all of them held by graduates of the Liverpool School of Civic Design. All of them. We were subject to a wave of British academics who came out and influenced the teaching and practice of architecture and planning in this country for the next 30 or 40 years. So I think that's something that maybe this school could pick up. I personally have done some research on the matter, but I didn't finish it off, but I do know that what I've just said is true. There was a way, Winston, Stevenson, Abercrombie, Jensen, and so on and so on and so on. All the faculties in every great city had a guy from Liverpool. <laughs> so, so let's get real. We'll have a look at this one. Thank you. I'm thinking of. Oh, sorry. Oh, Michael, you want to respond to that directly? You're not from Liverpool, are you, Michael? Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that the word history or the historian in ancient Greece was the histor, the one, who has, the one who has witnessed and who can therefore, through rhetoric, give a persuasive account of what they saw. We've just heard one just there. Um, the other thought was, um, Benjamin was mentioned by Michael, and I think I'm right um, in Benjamin's idea that the ideal book would, that he could write would be consist entirely of quotations. And um, that makes me think again of a fragment and the quotation in terms of his idea of the aura. We often quote because we want the auretic value of the quote in our text. It gives us some kind of um, 
Well, it gives a charge to the text, and we borrow the aura of that fragment. But at the same time, when you extract, when you fragment and extract, you destroy the aura, which is the problem of every museum. So I think it was suggested, I think, that there might be two ways of quoting. One is to quote and, and by quoting destroy the aura, or to quote and, and by doing that integrate the aura into a transformed text. Um, and in teaching history, it's the second that I always try and um, impart on the students. Thanks, Michael. Before coming back, yes, thanks, Sophie. Um, I just had a sort of quick question. I thought um, in the Cohen text, it was really interesting that it shows frottage as the um, medium of like, architectural quotation. Because you know, you argue that you quote it in contemporary with photography um, and all the pieces that you like, you literally just like a rubble in the ground. And I was just wondering if any of you could reflect on that, sort of like the, the fact that it shows that meaning, that it's quite interesting. It's like a shadow. Even without speaking directly to Cohen's motivations, what do you? How do you find that metaphor, the analogy, sorry, of the, of the the graphite rubbing as a as a way of things moving from one generation to the next? Uh, perhaps, like it, you know, from from my background, it's, you know, that, that that rubbing, you know, that's accompanied with, you know, important practices, of you know, storytelling that then, you know, continues to tell what that narrative is. And that's something that perhaps gets lost in the static nature of, you know, when you start to create these pieces and it's not accompanied by that cultural practice. So that then, so if it's thousands of years of continuous um, migration of, of story, then something's working there. But if just saying that the culture is be becoming erased, then perhaps there's an issue with that method of translating that information. Because it's like the, I guess, the, the aura notion and then, you know, Bannerman's translation thing, you know, it's like a, a, a con it's not about, with the text it's about someone over there can look at it and think through what it means when it's really about what is the actual aura of that text and someone who's heard it directly from them that can impart that knowledge. But you've got multiple t stories that have been just made up all over the place because of this, you know, static well, document. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think too that, and I can't speak to Jean Noy's motivations in using the analogy, but, um, but I do think that there is something to be said about the, where the agency lies and the transfer. Um, that it's not that the old thing tells the new thing what to do in, in a kind of genetic idea of influence that we've carried around for a long time, but rather that it's something to do with the way that we encounter the work, the pressure we put on it, the, um, the material that's used to, to take, the, to take the, uh, the imprint from one source and make it into something new. All of those are gestures in the present rather than uh, being foisted upon us from the past. I suspect that there's something in that, in that particular technique that he finds compelling. I, mean, I, I, do, I, I do want to come back to, to the point that you made, sir, over, um, over the kind of preponderance of uh, 
the kind of moments in which the way that we think about history of architecture is also shaped by institutions. And you spoke about the Liverpool moment. We could also introduce the moment of the architectural association that um, that arguably shaped another generation of uh, of teachers in design and uh, and theory uh, in this country. And I think that the kind of map that you showed right at the end, Pevand, of your presentation is also a kind of map of. I mean, we could we can appropriate those kind of maps in order to understand why we talk about what we talk about when we're standing in front of students, why we talk about what we talk about in a situation like this, the books that are moving around, the journals that are moving around. But more than this, the ideas that, um, that we regard as indispensable. And I think that even this idea of the, the indispensable, I, this concept of the indispensable idea as something that drives what is, sits at the center of the education that we um, share with students has, to a very large extent, diminished uh, and diminished in favor of techniques that can be used in all kinds of situations to understand exactly the kind of um, uh, sites and settings that we uh, that we were speaking about here this evening. Did I just put a line under things? <laughs> it sounded like that, didn't it? I, oh, sorry, one more question. Mm -hmm. that was uh, sorry, is it me? Uh -huh. Hi, um, I've always felt very amusing that like we've always felt the need to preserve what is like old, like for example, you might think like twice before tearing down the town hall or like you might want to preserve it for a really long period of time, but, but then you see all of those modern buildings and then you don't give it like a second thought and like, okay, let's demolish that. It's not useful, but history is useful. <laughs> it's there and you want to preserve that. So. That is like just a comment. And my, can you hear me? Um, um, I wanted to comment on uh, on the um, two things. One is Michael talking about uh, rubbings from sites, which is a cultural practice, which can uh, remove the history when it's not done properly or ignore it. And two, Michael. And then um, Michael Tower, uh, Michael Tower referring to aura around history and around ideas. And I'm thinking that um, something happens in the way that history is taught or perhaps talked about, which ignores that aura. I, the aura is the bit that I'm interested in. Every time I teach, I, refer, I, I remind the students that it's better to, have a, to be vaguely right rather than precisely wrong. That every idea, good idea, has an aura. And how do you find it? In terms of, con, in terms of history, I find that aura perhaps, and that's really a question to Michael, is to do with context. And that is the historical ideas are, and examples, are built on cultural context of the cultural values, which are like, how do you know, looking at forms and shapes, what values were that shaped it? And yet, they were there. And they were somehow to do with the place and time and the history, the continuity of, of the generations of teachers, including the Liverpool gang of people that put a big stamp on the history of 1970s in Australia. Anyway, I just wanted to just remind everybody about aura and context and the way how do you teach people to pay attention to context, to the, and to the, to the bigger picture, to the invisible. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I guess the, we did a boat cruise on Monday, um, Kath and I, with our students, and you just don't really get it until you're on the water and you're not travelling, you know, between, from point to point, you know, on a ferry that you've paid for the service for that privilege. But, you know, when you actually just get on the water, like, that's just, you're connecting with memories of place and that is a direct connection to the aura of this, of this place. And by, by doing that, you can then make those 
you know, associate however you choose to because you're really just interacting intimately with it. So even like, you know, and you, and you have to do that when you go into built forms, right? You've got you to gotta see it and feel it. Sure, I think um, maybe just tying along here, I think um, I'm, I'm really in teaching especially, I'm really interested in that moment of confrontation um, with the object. And um, I think I really like how Michael um, was kind of focusing on materials and materiality uh, in, in your presentation. And I think materiality is a really, really good starting point to ask those contextual questions. And I think as a teacher, I see my job as being there to kind of at least guide the questions, even if you know we can't always find the answers, guide the questions that are kind of, we can kind of construct thinking from the object outwards in a way. I would like to thank my history teachers that allow us to slow us down in order not to check the cover crocus and get fascinated by the new details or by the new things that were appearing in the middle of the 2000s. Uh, also the ones on history of art, of course. Um, also our studio teachers that, uh, and I think that's what we said, more direct quotation, that we, we hated them, but we loved their masters. And that's the misreading of history that I, I, I didn't like Avalos Herreros, but I love Alejandro de la Sota or I didn't like um, uh, Moneo, but I was in love with Zoiza. And I think these misreadings of history are like what I understood from Andrew, that it was a uh, history for architecture somehow. But maybe I got it wrong. <laughs> I'm going to put a line under it there. Uh, what, I, uh, what I hear in this, uh, in this discussion is, um, is a uh, deep interest in talking these things through and spending time thinking about them and valuing uh, the different ways in which uh, history figures in uh, contemporary architectural culture, in part to come back to old ideas uh, and old systems uh, with fresh eyes, in part to, uh, to test exactly those same things. Uh, and I think that the opportunity we have, and this is to thank Penelope one last time before we move out to the auditorium, the opportunity that you've given us, the provocation you've given us to, uh, to return to these questions, I think is, in, is invaluable. And I'm really grateful. I think we're all, one way or another, grateful that we had the chance to, uh, to open these conversations, these discussions back up again. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for our, our participants. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, please join us for a drink uh, out, in the, out in the foyer.